I mentioned, uh, team is calling you. So as I mentioned, it's, it's of course my the community of team when it's calling you. So it's a, an important group of entities. Team for business is a separate report that we come out in, in uh, Nagoya, which is where we are presenting all our reports. And I just want to give you a few quick highlights. It's addressing the business world generally. So it's very much addressing the sort of one size fits all approach. And there are chapters which uh, we want you to say the important chapters on the business impacts on ecosystem and biodiversity. How do you measure and how do you report? And then what can you do in terms of scaling down the risks that biodiversity is lost to represents the business? And what can you do to scale up for that matter the, the uh, opportunities that biodiversity losses actually represent the business? So well, my first theme today is about risks and opportunities. So once again, please don't take notes, just your mind will Firstly, let's look at risks. Now, these are all the main risk areas. The emissions risk, uh, habitat disturbance, conversion, excessive freshwater use, and depletion, huge footprint of marine. You heard about what's happening on, on fisheries. And we have pollution and waste. But in each of these, there's an opportunity. On the emission side, of course, we've got biocarbon offsets and the red plus, which is a massive opportunity, especially here in Brazil. Biodiversity offsets and conservation banking has been going on in the US and a few other places, and there's more opportunity here. Freshwater gives you the option to set up payments for watershed protection, payments for ecosystem services for freshwater. And once again, I believe there are a couple of such examples here in Brazil. Marine footprint is a significant issue uh, of the fisheries industry. But equally, you could go in for sustainable fisheries where you work collaboratively with the, the local government or the government, set up marine protected areas, create some financing for the transition, because during the transition of three to five years, or whatever it takes to restore fish stock, Need help. Yeah. It's better to spend money on that than to spend money on more trawler capacity. And finally, pollution and waste, which is of course a problem, we all know that. But then equally, there's recycling, there's terrible permits, and so on. So all of these risk areas are also corporate opportunity areas. If we look at some of what's been happening recently, there's been a significant increase in organic farming, and both in terms of volume as well as kind of countries where it's successful. Uganda is an amazing success story. Increase of from 45,000 to more than 200,000 licenses. Wetland banking is, is not a new story. It's been going on for some time. But uh, certainly red is, to me, the most interesting one. Because even though the red scheme has not actually happened, there's no law that's been passed. It's still under negotiation. And there's still a working paper in, in the UNFCCC. Already, there are more than 20 projects which are pretty much on the lines of what would be very digital. So if you like, there's speculative investment happening on the ground in order to anticipate the, the regulation that is to come. Uh, this is a sort of fairly standard textbook risk assessment analysis. <laughs> I just click through it very quickly because we don't really have the time. But essentially, all of the typical risk areas have some contribution from the loss of ecosystems and biodiversity whether it's operational risk or regulatory risk or reputational risk or market, should be market share, with your market share and product risk and financing risks. Each of these have some connection or some dimension which relates to ecosystems. It could be as simple as the operation size as cement companies running out of local sources of fresh water or agricultural concerns running out of soil utility and then becoming unprofitable because the cost of fertilizers and pesticides is, uh, fertilizers is too high or so on. It could be regulatory risk as correctly defined as the impact on the business of a change in regulation. If regulation changes, what was apparently profitable is no longer profitable. And that is a risk. Risk, in my mind, in my mind most people, risk is what can happen to your opinion now, basically. And as a business, you've got to watch that. But the first thing, if you want to manage your impacts on biodiversity or you manage the incidence of risks on you, the first thing, or manage your opportunities, the first thing you have to do is to measure because you cannot manage what you do not measure. So the measurement is the first step. The question is how. And measurement is, is a number of things. It's about assessing your biodiversity risk and your biodiversity opportunities. It's about setting performance indicators. Because if you're trying to increase something or decrease the risk, you need to set a reference level. We are here. We want to go there. There's a difference. That's your target. That's the matter. Finally, we need to apply valuation techniques. Because setting quantitative valuation sometimes is only half the answer. And very often it happens, and I'll show you an example of that, where people not using a common uh, currency, if you like, a common unit, 
can end up with a lot of in investment of time, space, and energy, and money in one area, and end up with actually very little result in the other. And finally, integrated reporting. And what do I mean by this? Why do we need disclosure? I mean, this is probably the most interesting one. I'm going to skip across uh, an example, a methodology example of how you can actually work out the footprint. Now, this is basically from China, and it's it's uh, forestry industry. Uh, so it's, it's construction industry whose main source of timber was China's forests. And over 40 odd years, China lost most of its forests uh, to a point where the loss of forests was creating massive soil flows <coughs> to the Yellow River <coughs> and an annual cycle of floods and droughts, which was creating significant stress to the human populations that were living there. Uh, that, as well as I guess some people would, would uh, um, cynically say that the fact that there were no more forests to cut anymore in China, uh, led to a regulation in 1998, which effectively meant that no longer was 64% uh, of China's forest, of China's industry sourcing wood from these forests, but in fact it was almost reduced to zero. This is an example, of, this is an actual picture of the kind of color that you can't see too well, but it's actually brown thanks to the loss of soil into the river due to water and wanton deforestation. That's just a picture of some logs. Instantly that ban was imposed, the price of timber went up. That's an expected reaction, anticipated uh, restriction in supply. And you can work out, based on how much the forest produced, you can work out the hectare values of the ecosystem services that you're getting. And you can, if you apply that calculation of what's the value of ecosystem services per hectare, and if you convert that to a different unit, which is the cubic meters of wood that's used by the construction industry, Here's what you get. You get that even though the price of timber was here, if you were to add on the loss of ecosystem services, you would get the real price of timber, which was another 129% of that. So effectively, the price, the real price of timber should have been 229% of what was actually trading in the timber markets in China. Massive mispricing. Who suffers? China suffers, obviously. <coughs> because of the loss of the ecosystems, because of the loss of forests, Soil nutrient flows lost, floods and droughts, washing away of topsoil, massive loss of fertility, all the usual. So it is the local country which suffers. Ironically, most of China's construction industry was exported in because of furniture and, and, and pre-cut wood and so on. And the, this spy diagram out here shows you where that all that uh, prefab material went. It went to it? USA, Japan. Korea. We were the three large importers of Chinese prefab and Chinese furniture and so on. So effectively it was China losing wealth and creating economic costs for its, its communities and providing